Good morning, guys. All right. You're here. You found it. First service at Ballston Quarter. It's absolutely exciting to feel the energy here to have you guys here. Now, you may have noticed not everything is completely done. Like there's a couple things that aren't quite right. Uh, and if this is your first time, we don't usually have all the kids in the auditorium. Uh, but we're very excited that it is family style this morning because uh, we're still finishing some stuff up in the kids space. And uh, we're going to be just one big fa happy family here. Um, if this is your first time, we're going to begin with a couple songs. The service lasts about one hour. Uh, and I'm going to encourage you guys, just take a deep breath. Take this moment in, because I know a lot of us have been looking forward to this. You guys have been on this journey with us for a while. But God wants to do something in this moment. And I know there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't know what your week was like, what your morning was like. But take a deep breath. Because God wants to connect with you here in this moment. So I'm going to encourage you. Let's stand together and enter in with a few songs.
I pray that we could see it, that we could feel your presence here. We thank you. We, we love you, and we pray to you things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for singing with us, Grace. You guys can be seated. All right. Guys, who is excited to be here today? Yeah. Oh, you guys are so much more energetic than 9 a.m. <laughs> Because 9 a.m. people are still waking up, getting used to it. Um, thank you so much for being here today. This is a new space. Uh, this is the day that we all waited for. I know for staff, we've been talking about this day for so long, and it's finally here. Promised myself I was not going to cry right now. Next service, probably. So stick around to see me losing on stage. Uh, but I'm just so excited. And with the new space comes just new opportunities to do things all around. And one of the concerns that a lot of people had with our move was, what about compassion and justice? What, what does this space change for compassion and justice? Are we gonna do less? Are we gonna just stop doing things altogether? And if that was you, if that was your concern, I am here to put your heart at ease and tell you that the answer is absolutely not. We're not gonna do less. We're not gonna stop loving people. Serving our community, it's what we do. It's who we are as a church, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So be happy. We're going to continue to love people because that's what we do best. So today I'm here to kick off our very first food drive here at Boston Quarter. And that is so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm just over the moon. This is just so, so, so exciting. So for the next two Sundays... March 5th and March 12th, we're going to be collecting food for AFAC. AFAC is the largest food bank here in Arlington County. On the screens, you can see what are the products that they really need right now. They are serving an average of 2,000 families a week in their food bank, so they really need help from us right now. And the coolest thing about this is that everyone can be a part of it. So for all the kids that are here in the auditorium, I see you all, and I love seeing all of you here. This is so much fun. And on the activity boxes that you have, you have coloring pages for AFAC. They love receiving those, those drawings for the kids. So if you want to color those and send it back to us, we would love to send it to AFAC. The youth ministry, do we have any youth here right now? No? Come on, teenagers. They're not gonna they're not gonna voice that they're here because you know teenagers. <laughs> Guys, if you're coming back tonight for youth ministry, bring your donation. We're giving you the chance to kick off this food drive. So make sure you bring your donation tonight when you come for youth ministry. And also, you guys, I I just I love working with this church. I love doing what I do, but I can only do it because you continue to help us. And it is a new space, it is a new time, but we are still the same church and we still have the same call to be famous for love and we can do this together. So let's continue to love people together as a church. Thank you so much. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
Thank you, Ted and Laura, very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here for our very first Sunday in this space. I appreciate you guys showing up. It's absolutely awesome. We're going to have a grand opening on March 19th, but there's no way I can't say something. It's impossible for me not to recognize something in this moment. For uh, so many of you, you, you've been serving for years, or a bunch of us have just been serving for a week in this room, or you've, uh, you've been praying for years, or you just started praying last week about this because you're brand new to the church, or you've been giving. I want to say a huge thank you to you. Uh, you guys have just been so awesome. 22 years as we have wandered the uh, wilderness. So this is a vision come true, like to be a church for people who don't go to church. And the first time we walked into this space, which was two and a half years ago, just an empty shell of a space. And the thing that hit me immediately, it feels like it's right in the center of everything. And here's the thing I was thinking about. I was thinking about this scripture in John chapter one, where it says, Jesus tabernacled amongst us? Like, what in the world does that mean? He tabernacled amongst us. It means this, that after they're, like, they're out in the middle of the desert, the Israelites, this famous thing, and the book of Exodus, and they're out there, and they're wandering around, and then they made a really bad decision with this thing they called the golden calf, and then God does something completely unexpected. God doesn't set up camp outside somewhere on a mountain, away, like separated. God says, you know what? I'm going to tabernacle. I'm going to move in right into the center of everything because that's who God is. And then Jesus comes along and does the same thing. So here's the thing I'm trying to say. When I walked into this space, I'm like, this reminds me so much of Jesus. It's like right in the center of life, at the heart, at the hub of everything. And that creates such like such higher degree of accessibility. Like God's saying, here I am in your midst. I'm not set off somewhere else. I'm right here and everybody is welcome in. And you guys have done so much to make that vision that God has given a reality. And I just want to thank you so much for doing it, okay? And we'll talk a lot more about that story uh, on March 19th. But for now, I wanted to say that. And I also want to recognize the staff has worked so hard. If you see a staff member, if you know a staff member at Grace, just say a big thank you because they have been working so hard over the past couple months to make this uh, to make this day happen. All right, we are in the middle of a series. Find your people, and I want to start by saying something really practical about finding your people because, like, so, okay, how do I find a friend? Like, where do I? How's this going to happen? How am I going to find a friend? So, Marissa Franco, in her book, she's a, a professor at the University of Maryland. She talks about it in a really practical way. Here's what you do. Simply do this. You go to a place where people that you think you would maybe kind of sort of want to be friends with, and that place is where they meet regularly, like it's a regular meeting place, and then you just go there quite often. So people who actually have friends, like in college, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, who has the most friends in college? The people who live in the center of the dorm. There was nothing strategic about that. They just randomly were put in the center of the dorm. And because you had to rub shoulders with people all the time, you just have more friends. And we need to think about this because it's so important. Because what we know is this, the quality of your life and my life is determined by the quality of our relationships, by the quality of our friendships. It's critically important. So you want to, like church, we meet every week, okay? So it's a regular recurring thing. All right, or you could join a, a, a team. And I don't say that because I'm trying to get you to join a team. We're actually not signing a team, but you meet the same people, right? Or you're in a Bible study group. So if you haven't done that or you want to do that, we do something over here called Grace in Five. It's something that's really, really practical. Now, this space is so grace, be, great because there's so many places to meet people and hang out with people. Uh, so I encourage you, after this is over today, just don't leave all of a sudden. Go check out the restaurants, the one right across the way from us. If you didn't see the sign, it's called Wino, right? It's right across from us, Wino. They have been awesome with us. They actually changed their brunch times. They moved them up earlier to, uh, to accommodate us. And they are offering us, they've been so kind. They have offered to do something really special with us, which I will talk about next week, okay? But explore the space before you take off because you gotta do those practical things. All right, so that's practical. That's how you find friends. But how in the world are you gonna keep friends? That's, now that's hard. It's really simple to find the friends if you'll just, find, if you'll just follow the practicality of it. But how do you keep a friend? Because all of us are imperfect. We're, we're all self-centered. We all hurt people. 
Me included. I heard this thing years ago. We all have an unlimited capacity for self-deception, right? So, you know, we offend people, we hurt people, we do that, and they do that back to us. And so it just, you know, you should kind of in some ways get over it because that's the deal, okay? But how do you heal a broken relationship or how do you prevent a relationship from breaking in the first place? That, everybody, is what today is about because that is really hard to do and you got to have high-quality friendships and relationships relationships in order for you to have the best life possible. This is what we've been saying. So what is the Bible? During this series, we've been talking about what exactly is the Bible. For me, for most of my life, I've been in church all my life. I, I thought the Bible was how to get to, it was a how to get to heaven book and how to stay, and we have kids in the room, I'll watch my language, how to, how to stay the heck out of the other place, right? I thought that's what it was for all my life. And then I looked at Jesus' elevator speech because he was asked this question, Jesus, what is the Bible? He says, it's about loving God, it's about loving others. So basically it says, it's about relationships. And so what we've been doing for the past couple weeks is we've been doubling down and tripling down, and I thought, what the heck, let's quadruple down today so that we can filter through what is happening in this incredible book called the Bible so that we can learn how to have the best relationships possible so we can have the best life possible. So Ted and Laura just read from Luke chapter four, the big showdown out in the desert with the devil. It's a big moment. And in that showdown, Jesus rebukes the devil, rebuffs the devil, kind of like punches him in the face uh, three different times. And he quotes all three times from the same book of the Bible. Does anybody know what book that was? Anybody at all? He quotes from the same book of the Bible. Anybody? Can't tell what you said, but I heard something out there. Deuteronomy. He quotes from Deuteronomy. Matter of fact, Jesus says, if you want to know who I am, if you really, really, really want to know who Jesus is, you have to start with the first five books of the Bible. And Deuteronomy is the last and final book of the Bible. Here's the cool thing about Deuteronomy. The key point, the main message in Deuteronomy is how to build strong, healthy, stable friendships. How to build a strong, healthy, stable society. That's the whole point of Deuteronomy. And so Jesus is saying here in his rebuke of the devil, hey devil, I'm gonna fight you off. Why? Through relationships. And it isn't so interesting. I'm gonna bring up a, 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 a author in just a moment, but he says the number way to fight off trauma and problems in our lives is through good relationships. So you wanna keep the bad stuff away from you? Healthy relationships. It is the key to everything. All right, the key word in the book of Deuteronomy is the word listen. It's mentioned over 90 times. The second key word is love. And think about this. If you're willing to listen to somebody, it's because you love them. If I don't love you, I'm not going to listen to you. To listen is to love and to love is to listen. And the key word in Deuteronomy is listen and the next is to love. Here's what I need you to remember today. If you don't remember anything else, lead with love. In the critical moments of a relationship, whether there's stress in a relationship or there's trauma or a little bit of conflict or a lot of conflict, what you want to do in those key moments, in those critical moments, is you want to lead with love. Remember, 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 remember this. Because the experts will tell you that if you lead with love in those moments, like those 15 minutes, that is where you should put all of your energy to having a great and lasting relationship. Because if you fail to do that, if you lead with something else other than love in those critical moments, you're probably going to break the relationship apart. And this is what I want to talk about today. So I want to, uh, I want to talk about this book, Platonic, by Dr. Marissa Franco. She's the one that gives so much practical advice, University of Maryland over here. But she tells a story at the beginning of this book. She says, two friends live in New York City, good friends. They decided, you know, they're such good friends, they're gonna take a road trip together. And they are, uh, they're gonna go from New York City, I think they had to go down to like South Carolina, and then they had to all go all the way up to Chicago. And on the first day of the road trip, that morning, one friend turns to the other friend and said, I broke up with so-and-so last night. I, I broke up with so-and-so. And the other friend says, good. You need to get away from so-and-so. He's not even thinking about you anyway. Don't text him. Don't call him. Just get over him. You need to move on. And that relationship right there began a huge break. And it was never recovered again. Why? What happened there? What happened there? Because the one friend did not lead in love in a moment when the other friend was hurting. And in those critical moments where there's some type of trauma, here's the key. Here is the key, everybody, that all the relationship experts will tell you is you have to actually lead with love. Now, relationships experts like John Gottman, he's the guy that's become so famous 
that he can put a bunch of probes on you in his little laboratory, put you in there for like 15 minutes and predict with a 90% plus rate whether or not your relationship, your marriage is gonna last or not. It's become famous for that. He approaches it like a scientist or Sue Johnson or Bessel van der Kolk. They all say the same thing. And they say you actually need an integrated brain in order to have a healthy relationship. Now I wanna show you something. We did this a few weeks ago. I wanna remind you of this. I'm just gonna put it up on the board. God is called in Genesis chapter one, Elohim. And in Genesis chapter two, God is called Yahweh. This is super important because scholars, some scholars looked at this years and years, years ago and they said, you know what? There's two different gods being spoken of here and that doesn't make sense. But if you go all the way back to the original intent and the meaning way, way back when, the sages will tell you this is done very intentionally, okay? So what is Elohim? So it says, in the beginning, God, Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The generic name for power is Elohim. People are called Elohim. So when the Bible says, don't worship other gods, I thought there wasn't other gods. How am I gonna worship other gods? It's telling you don't worship other, er it's a generic name. People are Elohim. Money is Elohim. Lots of things. There's lots of Elohim. You have Elohim. You're running around the room. God has the most, but there's lots of Elohim, okay? Yahweh, that's not generic at all. This is the unique name of God, Yahweh. No one else in scripture is called Yahweh. Let's look at the next slide. Let's differentiate, okay? Elohim is like a king or a master or a general or a judge. Exodus calls the judges, human judges, call them Elohim. Yahweh is a kind friend or a loving family member. Let's look at the next slide. Very commanding. So in Genesis chapter one, says God says, boom, you know, seize, make fish. You know, it's just like, boom, he's, he's very commanding. Yahweh? Very compassionate. That's Genesis chapter two. Let's look at the next slide, okay? Elohim makes rules. Yahweh shows mercy. Next. This is your boss, okay? That's more like your boss. This is your mother. If you have a kind and compassionate mother, okay? I just want, I have a great mother, so that's why I put mother up, all right? It is your mother. Do I have a last one to have another side up there? Yeah, Elohim speaks a speaker. What did the person do in the story I just told you from Platonic a minute ago? The one friend said, she spoke. She didn't listen. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I know that hurts. Talk to me. She didn't say that. She spoke. Boom, 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 boom. That's God. That's God, Elohim, right? Listens. Genesis chapter two. Do I have another one? Or is that the last one? Ah, very good. Okay, so you're getting the point, right? You've all heard of right brain, left brain. Left brain is your language. Left brain makes rules. Left brain can be very commanding. What does the bright, right side of your brain do? It's more compassionate. It's a, meal. It's, a, it's a feeling. It's the emotional side. So here's what God is showing us that is so important because all the relationship experts say you have to have both sides of your brain in a great relationship, but you have to lead with the right. You have to lead with love. Elohim will tell you how to solve your problems. Yahweh will sit down with you and listen to you in the midst of your problems. And when you're going through tough times, that is exactly what you need. You need both, but you need one of them first and the second follows. That's next week. We're gonna talk about Elohim a lot next week. I was in seminary class. It was a psychology class. And uh, they were talking to us about visiting people who were going through trauma. And the teacher said it very, I, the teacher said all kinds of stuff. I only remember one thing. I only remember one thing. It's because they probably said it in a very crass way. When you are talking to somebody who is hurting, I need you to do this. This is what the professor said. I need you to shut up and show up. Never forget it. I need you to shut up and show up. And I think of how many times in my life I have not followed that advice, even though I know it. So uh, I am very much Elohim. I try to remind myself. I don't know if anybody else in the room has had this problem, but like when Krista and I are talking and she's going through a tough time, my first, I mean, it's so powerful. It's so strong. And I'm like, have to fight myself. Actually, sometimes she's telling me about it and I just urge to say something. I will under the table so she can't see me. I'll just take my fingernails and I'll just dig them into my skin. And I'll just say to myself, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> to myself, to myself. Listen, 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 listen. It's so hard. But you will break a relationship if you don't lead with love. You have to lead with love. Now, here, let's look at love sense. Dr. Sue Johnson wrote two books. Um, they're on the outline on the app. You can, you can see them, but fantastic book. Highly recommend this book, Love Sense. This is what she says. I'm just going to sum the whole book up for you, okay? But you should still get it and read it. Let's look at the quote that she says. There it is. Okay, 
It's all new. We're working with new stuff here. In Love Sense, you will learn what I and other scientists, this is really important. You gotta look at, they're looking at relationships for the past 40 or 50 years scientifically. That was not really done a lot before. Have discovered from 30 years of clinical studies, laboratory experiments, and applied therapies. My particular contribution lies in relationship repair. Working with thousands of despairing couples through the years has led me to create a new systematic model for treatment called Emotionally Focused Therapy that honors our need for connection and support. Emotionally Focused Therapy, as it is commonly called, is the most successful approach to healing faltering relationships that has yet been devised with an astounding 70 to 75% success rate. And when you're talking about particularly like marriage counseling, that's off the charts. And the whole concept, I'll sum up the whole concept for you, is that when you have any, like it's a little tiny like in problem or it's a real big problem, you lead with love. You start with emotion. You start with the right side of your brain. You start with Yahweh. How many of us in this room, when we were going through a tough time and we needed Yahweh, we got Elohim instead? How many of us in the room, when we should have delivered Yahweh to somebody, we gave them Elohim instead? That's what happened on that car ride, and that friendship never, ever recovered from that. Now, I want to show you another book. This book has been on the bestseller list for more than three years. This guy is considered the leader internationally in trauma. He's done trauma work his whole life, and at the end of his life, he wanted to write this book to everybody else who's working in the trauma field. That's how it started. But then it erupted over three years on the bestseller list. Now, here's what he'll tell you. Here's what he'll tell you. And he sums it down. I thought he did a great job with this. He sums it down like this. He said, if you have a child, I know we got a bunch of kids in the room. If you have a child, and let's just say that child is bitten by a dog, and maybe you had told that child of yours, hey, stay away from the dog, stay away from the dog, stay away from the dog, and the dog, you know, the, the, the child didn't, didn't listen, okay? And the child gets bitten by a dog. Now, you have a choice. You could say, and they're crying, and they're hurt, and they're scared, and all. You could say, now, I told you. I told you. I told you to stay away. You could do that. And Bessel van der Kolk says this. He says, if you do that, and we all experience trauma. He said, there's trauma everywhere. If you do that, it'll leave a trauma inside of you that will last maybe for the rest of your life. However, if you do this, if you get down with that child and instead of scold them and say, you know, I am so sorry, and hug them and hold them and say, I know that hurt, but I want you to know now you're safe and you're calm and compassionate. He said, over, trauma, out. Think about that. Think about that. That is absolutely amazing. And how much trauma, how, how much stuff have we experienced because we did not get that reaction or we have not given that reaction to somebody else, okay? So you have to, have to, have to lead with love. Now, let's take a turn and let's look at God because God models this for us. Like God introduces this to us in our world in Genesis chapter one and two. But what was happening to the Israelites in the book of Exodus is they were an enslaved people, they are a broken people. So God speaks in the book of Deuteronomy 4.28 and he says this, very important. He says, there you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. Now, Moses is speaking. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. And he's saying, you, you're going to be drawn to worship Elohims. But those Elohims won't listen to you. They won't hear you. They're not there for you. And what is God saying? I am. I am. That's who I am. I'm here as Yahweh to listen to you and to love on you. In Exodus chapter three, something very famous happens. Moses has this meeting with God. They're out in the middle of the desert. And we're told this, that God says, you know what? We're, we need to free the people. And he says, I have heard their cries. He says, I am aware of their sufferings. Now, uh, that word, aware, is a Hebrew word called yada. If some of you have ever watched Seinfeld, okay. And I will tell you, if you're looking around and somebody's laughing, ask them why, why, why you're laughing now. And the reason I'm going to do this all the time is because a couple weeks ago, somebody told me, yeah, I asked this years ago, and two people looked, and after service, they met and talked, they got married, and they have a kid. So, all right, you see somebody laughing, go introduce yourself as a friend, right? Yada, 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 okay? So in the biblical concept, it means to biblically know somebody, but it also means this. It means to be personally aware of something. In other words, God is saying, I have heard the cries of this broken people, this enslaved people, this 
has traumatized people. I have heard their cries. It personally has affected me. It personally has affected me. And I want them to know that I feel their pain. Now, what, what one word sums that up? What one word sums that whole thing up? God is saying, I am a God of empathy. God is a God of empathy. And this is super important. This is who God is introducing himself to us as. So then God says, uh, Moses, I'm gonna give you three signs. And this is where it gets really cool. I'm gonna give you three signs to convince the Israelites. And I used to read these. And first of all, I thought, oh, these are the three signs that are for the Egyptians, not the Israelites. But no, it's for the Israelites to convince them that they actually can trust in God. And what are the three, th- three signs? He says, take your staff, he was a shepherd, take your staff in your hand, throw it down, and it becomes a snake. And he runs from it. And then God says, go over and, and pick, it, pick it back up. And he picks it up and it turns back into a staff. I was like, oh man, that's cool. And then he says, hey, Moses, take your hand and put it inside your robe and pull it back out. He pulls that, it's all white, it's leprous. It's like, oh my gosh. And he says, finally, if they won't believe the first two, they'll believe the last one. Take some water, pour it on the ground and it all turns to blood. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I didn't think about this earlier. It's like, okay, that's great, that's great. This is a great power. It's like magic, right? But why did God choose that? It seems so random. And why three? And how about pulling a rabbit out of a hat? I mean, what about, why those three, everybody? Well, here's one thing, is that the Egyptians, the Egyptians had called the Israelites snakes. You ever done this, don't raise your hand? You ever, when you didn't like somebody, called them a name? You ever called somebody a name? Or has somebody ever called you a name? I was uh, just overhearing a phone call, actually, this past week. And uh, two people were talking that in San Antonio, anybody from San Antonio? San Antonio? No? And a couple people first service from San Antonio. San Antonio Zoo for Valentine's Day will uh, allow you, right, to name your ex, right, after a roach. After a roach. That's, that's the way they are down in Texas. No, no, it's not just Texas because the Bronx Zoo also has a name a roach program. Ah, isn't that fantastic? All right, how about those people up in Canada? I thought they were supposed to be so nice and chill, right? Oh no, back to the, there we go. Roses are red, violets are blue. Is there someone in your life that's bugging you? Give them goosebumps by naming them a cockroach in their honor this Valentine's Day. Oh, that's fantastic. And not to be outdone, our British people, and many of you know that Pastor Derek is from England. They got in on the act. And in England, it's not an animal, but you can put the name of your ex right on a nasty, dirty garbage bin. Like, so they could say like Derek 80, so to speak, right there. You know what? You, you, you know what I'm saying? And how about down under? They do the same thing in Australia. I don't know if anybody's from Australia, but you got in on the act too, because what can you do down there? A snake, a snake. Your ex is a snake and name it. So we, this is the stuff that we do. We name things and it's, it's, it's really funny, but there's three terrible things that happen in Exodus 1 that matches the three signs that God gives Moses in Exodus 3. What are they? Here's where the whole thing starts. We're told in Exodus 1, 7 that the Israelites are swarming. That word swarming specifically is connected to animals. Like almost every time it's used, it's used of animals who are begin to creepy, crawly, to swarm. So what's the creepiest, crawliest, scariest thing that comes from the ground that's crawling on the ground? It's a snake. It's a snake. And they had called them snakes. Now, where does every single genocide begin? Every single one throughout history, it begins by calling people some name that dehumanizes them. So slavery was possible in the book of Exodus because of dehumanizing and calling them a name. That's why Jesus says, don't call somebody a fool because it'll end up in murder. That's where it starts. Anybody ever called you a name? Can you still remember that name to this day? Maybe it's 30 years ago and you can still clear as a bell name. It's sinister, but here is where it all begins. So what Egypt was doing is calling them animals, calling them snakes. And what they had been, just like the staff, and the word staff is the same word for tribe, like the 12 tribes of Israel, the people. It says, take that staff and throw it down, just like those people have been thrown down, and just like some of you have been thrown down. And just like some of us has actually thrown other people down with our words and throw it down. It's a snake. It's an animal. It's less than, it's not human. 
And Moses, go over and pick it up because that's a person who deserves empathy. Lead with love, lead with love. Every genocide begins this way. This is why it's so important. Think about your words and lead with love. Love And so God is impressing this right from the beginning. If you wanna heal a traumatic experience, you have to lead with love. That's the first thing that takes place. What's the second thing that takes place? The Hebrew midwives. Now, actually, we don't know. We call them Hebrew midwives, but because of their names, we're not sure if they're Hebrew or Egyptian. But here's what we do know. Every hero in the opening pages of Exodus is a woman. Every single one is a woman. Pharaoh's daughter, Hebrew midwives, Moses' sister, on and on it goes. He says to the Hebrew midwives, Pharaoh calls them in. Now, you don't disobey. Pharaoh was a god, and he was all-powerful. You disobey Pharaoh, you die, end of story, no questions asked. And so what happens is, Pharaoh says to the Hebrew midwives, every male baby that is born, you kill. You kill. Now, death. What does leprosy, remember the second sign? Moses took the hand in here, like this is just so random. Well, who cares? I mean, leprosy, ah, right? What does this mean? Death, leprosy in the book of Exodus represents death over and over and over again. And so we say to the Hebrew midwives, kill every male baby that is born. Now, what happens with victims? What is part of the mental trauma that goes on? We feel like we deserve it. These people deserve to die. These people, hand in. These people deserve to die. God says, no, you don't deserve to die. We're told the Hebrew midwives, the first act of civil disobedience that we know of in recorded history is right there in Exodus chapter one. They defy Pharaoh, but they do it in a very ingenious way. They say to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like, why aren't they dying? Why aren't they dying? And the, what do they say? They say, those Hebrew women are very lively. You know what the word lively means? Almost 100% of the time, it means animal. So they fool him at his own game. You call them animals? Well, they're animals, and they give birth really, really quick, not like uh, these Egyptian women. And it says, because of what they did in their civil disobedience, do the right thing and honor God, God blesses them, which is kind of interesting because they lie, and God blesses them for it because there is a higher value there. So that's the second sign, death. Well, what about the last one? What are we gonna do with this Nile into blood thing? What is God trying to communicate to us about this? Well, we're told that Pharaoh says to the people, not to the army, but to all the Egyptians living, like your neighbor next door, if they're an Israelite, if they're a Hebrew, and they have a child, and that child's born, and it's a boy, rip that child, think about this, out of the mother's arms and throw it into the Nile. Now, what happens when you throw a baby in the Nile? I mean, other than the fact that you think that child is going to pass away, all right, right? Is that when you wake up the next day after all the trauma from the night before, the Nile looks exactly the same. Nothing's changed. The water is calm. The water's placid. There's no sign. Like, the Nile hasn't turned blood red. There's trillions of gallons of water in the Nile. Everything looks the same. Baby's gone, it's like nothing ever happened. Do you know what happens to somebody when they experience a trauma and nobody acknowledges it? Has that happened to you? Do you know anybody it's happened to? I do. I know somebody that they caught their spouse in a very bad situation, red-handed. And they admitted it in the moment. And then a few weeks later, they just started saying, no, that never happened. No, you're imagining, they never happened. You never, you never did it. They didn't acknowledge. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that person for the past 35 years in their life has not been able to move beyond that trauma. It has wounded them. It'll actually drive you insane if your wound is not acknowledged. And so what does God do? He says to the Israelites, I have seen your pain. Number one, you're not an animal. Number one, you're not an animal. You're not a snake. You're not a snake. I love you, and you deserve dignity. Number two, you don't deserve to die. You don't deserve it. The Egyptians say you deserve to die. I'm telling you, you don't. And finally, God is saying, I have heard your pain. I have seen your pain, and we're gonna turn the water from the Nile River red. So that's the three signs. And we're told that after those three signs that the Israelites believed, they trusted God. And then it became the, actually the first plague. So God then to the entire Egyptians who refused to acknowledge this, okay, I just want all the Egyptians to know who I am too. I have seen the trauma. I am acknowledging what has happened. Everybody, and I'm asking the music team to come out because we're gonna end with a song, Reckless Love. I wanna say some things to you just real briefly. This is so important, okay? With everything I've said this morning, 
Your relationships are critically important if you're gonna have a strong, healthy, good, stable life, period. End of story, the data is just overwhelming with that. How are you going to have it? You're gonna have it with, during those very, very critical moments, you are going to lead with love. And if you don't lead with love the same way that God models before us to lead with love, you're gonna break a relationship, maybe beyond repair. Now, those of us in this room that you needed love and you got something else and you're still wounded from that and we wanna pray for you. We talk a lot about being God's hands and feet. We talk a lot about that, God's hands and feet. But you know what? God needs arms and ears too. And since God has shown us this is what it means to reflect God, then we ought to take up that mantle and deliver that and reflect that to the rest of the world. I can remember years ago, I was going through a terrible, terrible, terrible time. And a lot of people had all kinds of like, you should do this and you should do this and you should do this. And I had a friend that called me and he said, John, there's only one thing I want you to know. I'm with you. Some of you here this morning, God wants you to know just one thing right now. We'll get to all the other stuff next week. Okay, but right now, God is with you. He has empathy and compassion and love. He is Yahweh to you. And we need to be Yahweh to others to heal relationships. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord. There are those of us in the room that we have suffered greatly. There's traumas in our lives that we haven't been able to move past. And Lord, I just ask that you would wrap your arms and your love around all of us in this room that are experiencing that so we can move on with our life and be what you want us to be and do what you want us to do. Lord, help each one of us to experience as we're getting ready to sing the reckless love of God, your reckless love. Please, God. Now, Lord, also help us to reflect your reckless love. Help us to respond in love, not in power, not in Elohim, not with lots of words, but just showing up to be your arms of love, to be your ears that listen, to lead with love. In Christ's name, amen. Everybody, our prayer team is going to be right over here after this song. If anybody would uh, like to be prayed for, let's all stand and sing Reckless Love together. spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. To me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Ooh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found beneath the night. I don't deserve it. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. Thank you, Jesus. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. Oh, my God. 
take just a moment there we go and say a quick prayer as we wrap up today's service so if you will bow your heads with me God we are so incredibly grateful for your love father that you do not remain silent or distant in our trauma in our suffering in our pain and I pray that through your Holy Spirit we would be that for other people that we would listen and be present for those in the greatest need in your name amen So John mentioned it during the service. If you want prayer for anything, our team is right over here. They would love to pray with you. Um, And if you're new, this is your first time, I'd love to meet you at the bottom of the stairs right here just to meet you, share a little bit about who we are. Now, I want you guys to know this is the first time we've ever met in this space. And I want you to go to Explore. Actually, Wino across the hall opened up early for us. It's a great brunch place. You can check that out. Just go explore. Say somebody, say hi to somebody on your way out. And we want to say thank you for being here. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Have a great day.